You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, class, take your seats. I said take your seats. Class, sit. I swear you're all acting like a bunch of animals. <laughs> Pet Life Radio presents Teacher's Pet, where you'll learn how to understand and communicate with your pet and train them to be the best pet they can be. It's time to see the world from your pet's point of view. So give a tail-wagging welcome to your Teacher's Pet host on PetLifeRadio.com. You may even learn a few tricks yourself. Hi, welcome to Teacher's Pet on Pet Life Radio. This is Pia Slavani, Director of Training and Behavior at St. Hubert's Animal Welfare Center in Madison, New Jersey, and your host. I'd like to welcome this week's special guest, Karen Pryor. Karen is a behavioral biologist with an international reputation in actually two fields. The first is marine mammal biology, and that's where I've known Karen for many years back, and behavioral psychology. Karen was a founder of Hawaii's Sea Life Park, where her work with dolphins pioneered modern, force-free animal training methods. And I know when I started years back looking for positive training, actually Karen was one of the first people that I went to listen to, and I was so thrilled and excited about her bringing this into the dog world. Karen is the author of many popular books, so if you haven't read them yet, please make sure that you check her website out or Google her and you can see them. But her most recently, the newest book is Reaching the Animal Mind, what the clicker training method teaches us about all animals. So before we meet Karen, let's take a short break to hear from our sponsors. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Okay, class, grab your tuna flakes, biscuits, and bones. Teacher's Pet will be back in two shakes of a tail, right after recess. Pawfume Dog Grooming and Finishing Spray is proud to be a new sponsor of Pet Life Radio. Pawfume Super Long Lasting Sprays are available in four unique fragrances. Each Pawfume spray is fortified with the finest conditioners and detanglers to make combing out your dog more fun. Pawfume retails for only $2 per 6 ounce bottle. Pawfume is available nationwide at all Dollar General and Family Dollar stores. Why pay more to have your dog smell great? Pawfume, P A W F U M E. It's time for school for you and your friends, your furry best friends. Train your dog the fun and easy way with Teacher's Pet Sessions. Teacher's Pet host Pia Silvani teaches you step-by-step how to train your dog the fun and easy way. You get eight 30-minute live audio training sessions, complete transcripts of each session, plus a basic training manual to get you and your dog off to a great start. Training begins the moment you bring your dog home. Teacher's Pet Sessions offers positive reinforcement training to shape your dog's behavior and encourages upbeat, enthusiastic responses to ensure that your dog will enjoy learning. Teacher's Pet Sessions dog training is fun at both ends of the leash. So listen, learn, and laugh with your dog with Teacher's Pet Sessions. Get your copy of Teacher's Pet Sessions Volume 1 today. To order, go to teacherspetsessions.com. Hi, this is Pia Salvani, your host. Bring your dog, tug toy, and treats, and get ready to have some fun. Teacherspetsessions.com. I'm Christine Latham, host of The Pampered Pooch. And I'm Vicki Nixon, your co-host. Ever get tired of people that say it's just a dog? Well, we do. It is a growing trend that people love and treat their pets like they are their children. This podcast series will be on topics inclusive of how people pamper their pooches, no matter how big or how small they are. On The Pampered Pooch, we'll talk about pet parties, happening social events, health, and nutrition. Each week, we pick a product of the week, a pooch of the week, and a pooch needing to be adopted. If you like to treat your pet like the royalty they are, then The Pampered Pooch is for you. Every week, on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, class, hang up your collars and leashes. Teacher's Pet is back in session. Now park yourselves on the floor. I said park, not bark. Ugh. Okay, Teacher's Pet. Pay attention. There may be a quiz later. Welcome back. This is Pia Silvani, host of Teacher's Pet on Pet Life Radio. 
I'd like to welcome our special guest today, Karen Pryor, who will be talking to us about reaching the animal mind. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hi, Pia. Thank you so much for this wonderful chance and uh, nice to talk to you. Thank you. I'm thrilled to have you on, too, and I know that the audience will be very interested in hearing from you. Let me start off with a question. Since you've spent more than 30 years training animals, specifically dolphins, tell us a little bit about what kind of training you did with dolphins and why you decided to change dog trainers' minds about how we were training dogs. Uh, Well, that's kind of a two-part question. We started, I trained dolphins for about 10 years, and after that, my connection with them has largely been as consulting to uh, the Navy and consulting to the uh, fishing industry and doing my own research. But those 10 years in the beginning were the, was just when B.F. Skinner's operant conditioning was coming out of the laboratory and the dolphin trainers were among the very first to make real good use of that. Um, it, was, it was the first time that people were using with animals some of those techniques that research had uncovered the conditioned reinforcer, shaping behavior, uh, successive approximation, uh, chaining, a lot of things that came out of the laboratory that were not part of traditional animal training or any other kind of training because we didn't really know about them before then. I was lucky enough to just, coming from a horse and dog training background, both of them traditional, I had been an obedience competitor, I had bred and shown horses for many years, I was fascinated. I was fascinated when I stumbled across the idea that you could train an animal without touching it, you could train it without ever using force or deprivation or anything to frighten it. We were going to be dealing with wild dolphins after all. They were already frightened. We didn't want to make that worse. And uh, and I had these wonderful animals to practice with. I, I tell in the book how I fell into the job, but uh, that was just an accidental circumstance. But these animals were many species. We had in the end up to an, over a dozen species in captivity at Sea Life Park in Hawaii, where I was. Nobody knew anything about them uh, up till then. Some of them had never even been seen alive by scientists. And for me, the fact that they wasn't, I wasn't excited about training them because they were beautiful and intelligent and all that. I was excited about training them because we were going to use food as the medium of exchange, and these were great big animals. They could eat a lot before they filled up. So you had plenty of room to make mistakes about what you rewarded or reinforced and what you didn't. They were perfect practice animals. Mm. Um, (laughs) And they proved to be full of uh, (coughs) interesting challenges. Some species... Uh, are not friendly. Some species are very intelligent and love to play. Well, our definition of intelligent is that they're like us. They're curious and they're investigative and they want to do new things and so on. And other species are much more conservative. So that was all very interesting. What came home to me through that experience had nothing to do with dogs. It was that this is the way we should be training people. We should not be trying to boss our kids around. I wanted to write a book that would see to it that all the parents and the entire planet stopped yelling at their kids. Because (laughs) there is a better way. There is an alternative that works. It's not just being nice and so forth. There was this beautiful technology for getting the behavior you want without having to use force. That's what fascinated me. The book that I wrote came out in uh, 20 years ago, uh, 1985, and it was called, by my publisher, Don't Shoot the Dog. It was a book about teaching and training without punishment. It was not about dogs at all. But the dog no, trainers, it wasn't. No, and the dog trainers picked it up. They were the first people to really take this book seriously. They said, oh, this must be about dogs. Oh, wait a minute, there's only two dogs in it, and one's on page 100 and whatever. But they realized that the system, the technology that was being explained here was a technology that they could use with their dogs. And people started experimenting with it. So it was really the dog trainers who came to me, Pia, and said, come and talk to us. You've got to talk to us. We love your book. You've got to talk to us about how you do this with dogs. And at first I went, "Mm, I don't know. I had never <laughs> talked about it with uh, I had never uh, thought you know I hadn't really thought about that but I took 
up one of the invitations to a, and I went to talk to a couple of hundred dog trainers all day for a day. I gave my first seminar and um, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> you were there. I was not cool. In yes, I was. Oh, I'll yes. be darned. And yes, it was. A, it was the. Inter- it was the. What's the name of the organization, Pia? The uh, NADOI, National Association N- of Dog right. Obedience Instructors, and everybody was traditional. Everybody used the choke chain. It was the way I had, in fact, first been taught to train dogs. But by that time, I could say, hey, here's another way to do that. And we had a lot of fun. That day was the beginning of my friendship with a huge community of new practice animals, dogs and their owners. And I think what I liked about it most, especially when I read Don't Shoot the Dog, I thought, this is how I was raised. My mother never yelled at us as children, yeah. ever. So I, it was very positive. She focused on that. So that's how we were raised with our dogs as well. So it, it was was it an interest? So that's why I had to attend. But talk to our audience a little bit. Um, Carolyn Barney was on a few sessions ago, and people can go back yeah. to that about the, the basics of clicker training. But tell the audience why you enjoy clicker training as opposed to using um, simply using your voice. I'll tell you why I enjoy training this way. It brings the animal to life. Instead of making it stop doing things, you're teaching it new ways to start doing good things. It puts you on an equal basis. I love the sparkle in the animal's eye. I love it when the animal asks me a question, and this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the animal is. It doesn't matter if it's a puppy. It doesn't matter if it's an elderly horse in a pasture. It doesn't matter if it's a guinea pig saying, wait a minute, you clicked me for this, and now you aren't clicking me, so let me try a little harder. How about this? And it looks you right in the eye and does something a little strong. You click that, and the animal goes, yeah, I got it. And I love that interchange where both of us are exploring together very fast and very much in a communion. You know, it's a communion. Normally, when you mm-hmm. are training the old way, boy, it's not. It's me doing you must do and you obeying, and, and there's no... <laughs> sense of of that feeling that you're both two wonderful creatures on the universe and you're exchanging communication. Don't get that. So that's why I love it. The question about why do you need the little clicker? Why do you need that sound maker? I'm looking for one. Here's one. Why do you need that when you could just say yes and good dog and so forth? The role of the clicker is to only do one thing. It sends a message that you're right and food is coming or toy or something good is coming. You're right, you win a prize. And it sends it, what's important about that is the moment when the animal hears that sound. Whatever their body is doing at that moment, that gets marked, sort of like a checklist in the brain. Check, that is a good thing to do. They'll remember that and they'll do it again. Now the reason they will remember it is that way it's processed in the brain. That sounds very uh, spacey, but we all knew that. You know, Pia, you yourself, I'm sure, have been aware for years that when you pick up a clicker, something different is happening. But we didn't mm-hmm. know what exactly until I was writing this book, and I really spent four years working on it. And in the course of those four years, I really dug into the people who do understand the inside of the brain, which is the neuroscientists. And there I found that they had known all along When you build a conditioned reinforcer that only means a good thing is coming, it is treated differently by the brain. Instead of you having to think about it, it goes right to the oldest part of the brain, the amygdala, and there it creates two things. A lasting memory, even if this is the first time that you've heard it, a lasting memory and an emotion. Now we're kind Mm -hmm. of used to this in terms of fear, fear signals. When you have learned to be afraid of the sound of the door slamming, that's a conditioned fear sound. The door slams, that means your boss is in a bad mood. That, too, goes right to the amygdala and creates an emotion of fear, and that's been studied enormously. The positive side of it, the positive pathway, hasn't been studied quite so much, but the click follows that positive pathway, and it creates an emotion of joy. That's a good point. It does that because it's completely different from everything else. So the big advantage to the clicker is only that it is something the dog has never heard before. It is not 
true of your voice. Your voice that's all the animals, including every animal in the zoo, they already know a lot of things. They have heard your voice in a million different ways. They've heard lots of It has a blurry meaning, and it never means necessarily good things. You right, know, the, right. The human voice is already kind of what we call a poisoned cue. It might be mm-hmm. good, it might be bad, and we don't know. And right. so that doesn't go through the amygdala at all. That goes right to the frontal part of the brain where you can mull it over. Hmm, she said, yes, I wonder what that really means. I think a big part of it too, Karen, don't you think um, our emotion is part of our voice many times. Absolutely. You know, when we, dogs hear me laugh, for example, they all come running and wag their tail. Yes. good things have happened. So there's yes. my emotion that's involved as well. And it's meant to be that way. We couldn't clean that out if we tried. Uh, you know, we're, our voice is a way of communicating, I mean, not only our present mood, our sex, our age, our native language, how we feel mm-hmm. about, you know, which is a huge amount of inf- information is packed into that little word. And all of that kind of dims down the piercing clarity of the meaning of that little sound. So right, right. Th- that's that's why we use the click, or it can be um, it could be another sound. You can use a bell or a buzzer or something. It, it just has to be something different from your voice. It can be a light. Um, for deaf dogs, we use a flashlight. Flashlights are mm-hmm. good for fish too. If you're training a fish, you didn't know you could train a fish, did you? You can. Yes, They're I did. Very, <laughs> you, you did. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. No, I meant, the, I'm thinking of the listener. You can easily train a goldfish to swim through a bracelet. You can tra- train a fish to go through a hoop, in other words. Uh, and for there, you need another marker signal, but they don't hear this very well underwater. So you use, uh, so they use a flashlight blink. For right. our dolphins, we now, use the whistle. We've talked now about more positive, and many people, I think, confuse positive training with being very permissive and they ask well what if the animal does something wrong and i mean don't you you have to punish don't you well how do you respond to that i think very often we've been trained to believe that and certainly that's the way things happen in schools and so forth and society at large but we look at that in a different way if there's something going on that you don't like or can't handle, you know, something that really has to be interrupted, your first job is to arrange the environment so the behavior stops. Move the dog, shut the dog up, bring the dog inside, whatever. You have to stop the behavior. Punishing the animal at the moment that it's doing what you didn't want it to do uh, will frighten it all right, and it may stop all kinds of behavior, but it doesn't necessarily affect the behavior you set out to punish. Uh, the effects of right. punishment are very variable, and the one thing we do know is that it shuts down any idea that you and the animal are having fun together. So we kind of yeah. uh, deal with bad behavior by interrupting it and making it less possible, and then the bad behavior tells you, you have a training job to do here, and the training job is train some other behavior that you prefer. So, you know, the dog uh, chewed on a piece of, uh, chewed up your new shoes. Well, first place. What were your new shoes doing lying around where the dog could reach them? Shut the closet door. Second Mm -hmm. place, use the clicker to teach the dog what it can chew. Here, this is a toy you may chew. Here, this is something that I'm going to give you that you are welcome to chew. Uh, Dogs need to chew. It's good for them. It passes the time. It's sort of the dog version of crossword puzzles, I think. Karen, just before we go on to a break, we just need to take a very quick break to hear from our sponsors. Just a note on that. What I tell trainers when I'm lecturing and when they're educating pet owners is we can be sloppy with positives. So, oh, oops, we gave an extra treat. Big deal. Or our timing wasn't real great, but that's okay. But we cannot be sloppy with punishment. Oh, and when we are, we may do more harm than good. In fact, that's the way to get in trouble. You're better off rewarding what you like than trying to get rid of what you don't like. Absolutely. Well, hang on, everyone. We'll be right back. We're just going to take a short break to hear from our sponsors, so don't go away. Okay, class, grab your tuna flakes, biscuits, and bones. Teacher's Pet will be back in two shakes of a tail right after recess. Give your dog some thought with Dog Thoughts. It's the iPhone application that everyone's talking about. Hey, what do you think of this? A man in Davis, California says he's invented an application for the iPhone that claims it can read your dog's mind. Huh? No, it's true. I read about it on my cat's Twitter page. That's fine. 
Jay Leno talked about it, CBS reported on it, and now you can see what all the buzz is about. Created just for dog lovers, Dog Thoughts makes taking photos of your furry best friend more fun. Shake your dog and read his mind. <gasps> on your iPhone, of course. Take a pic of your pup, shake your phone, and watch as his thoughts appear on the screen. Does he have a bone to pick with you, or is he having a tail wagging day? Get your Dog Thoughts iPhone app today. Just 99 cents. Go to PetLifeRadioPromotions.com. That's PetLifeRadioPromotions.com. Greetings, human. What planet am I on? Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in Paparazzi, Candid Pictures of You and Your Pet. For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No. To my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. That's it. You're madder than a junkyard dog, and you're not going to take it anymore. Your feathers are ruffled, your dander is up, and you've got a definite bone to pick. Join us each week on Pet Peeves, the show that lets you dig through the dirt and unleash your passion for pets. Your host, pet expert and award-winning author, Amy Shojai, will talk about what makes you howl and what hisses you off. Pet Peeves, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, class, hang up your collars and leashes. Teacher's Pet is back in session. Now park yourselves on the floor. I said park, not bark. Ugh. Okay, Teacher's Pet. Pay attention. There may be a quiz later. Welcome back to Teacher's Pet on Pet Life Radio. This is Pia Silvani, your host, and joining us today is Karen Pryor, a behavior biologist who started her training with dolphins 30 years back. Karen, in your new book, uh, you talk about learning to learn, reaching the animal's mind. I really like that chapter. Can you just expand upon that a bit? Well, you know, one of the things that we don't always realize is that all animals are designed by nature to learn new stuff all the time. They get along in their world by exploring their environment, not just out of desperate need, they're hungry, they're thirsty, they're tired, but just for fun. They're actually programmed. The brain is designed to learn and have fun. And that's true, I think, right down. Well, let me put it this way. I haven't gotten... I haven't clicker trained any insects yet, but I haven't found anything <laughs> down to that level that doesn't like this game. So what we're tapping into with clicker training, with this technology, whether you're using the clicker or not, we're tapping into the animal's natural ability to explore and to learn and to get better and more skilled at doing things. Uh, I think that's a natural way to learn, and I can tell you it changes your animal. It changes you and the animal. When you've got, oh, a big old fat plump, let me say, house cat that you've had for years, and really the only time you get any life out of it is when it hears the can opener. Well, when you pick up a clicker and you and the cat discover that with the clicker it can make you deliver a favorite treat. All it has to do is raise one paw. And so between you, you teach the cat to give you a high five. Just that cute little trick, and there's description of that in my book, Reaching the Animal Mind. There's a step-by-step for a high five cat. The cat goes, oh my goodness, I've got this person trained to give me tuna fish. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and the cat has a new interest in life, and you have a new fun thing to do with your cat and between you you have kind of woken up that animal's intelligence and now 
you can see that cat start developing new ways to communicate with you, not through meow, 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 feed me, feed me, and not through knocking things off the door, but through delightful new ideas, things. It, it really increases the animal's sociability. Uh, I, I think sometimes in... In a, in a, it's kind of a thrill to me to see that turn around, to see an animal that did not really pay much attention to its people to suddenly become fascinating. People always say, oh my Lord, I had no idea this dog was so smart. That's right. We do a lot of clicker training with the cats in our shelter okay. because when you think about it, they're sitting in cages and many of them can be there for several months at a time with yeah. no mental stimulation whatsoever. And we find that they're joyous when they see the little tongue depressor come out. That's how we feed them or uh-huh. a little target stick. So they start batting at that. They get right. excited. They get up and they're excited about it. So learning to learn, I thought that was a wonderful chapter. And the other chapter that I really like was the chapter that you wrote on feelings. Um, and, and there was one segment of that. You said, could an animal say thank you? Talk to us a little about that. Yes. I, I, that's just a little bit of the scientific observation creeping into the book that, that hasn't been published, that nobody had really uh, put into the scientific literature. Uh, the neuroscientist Yak Pang Sep said to me once that you have to realize that we've treated animals like machines, but they are not machines. We treat them like an empty vessel and stimulus comes in and and stimulus and behavior comes out. That's not really what's going on. Animals have feelings. They have preferences. They have intentions. (laughs) They have plans. And, um, And once you recognize that, once you allow yourself to say, well, it's not anthropomorphic of me, this animal does prefer uh, whatever. It, it, you can watch them. You can study that. And one of the things I, I noticed, in, as one, once I began working with lots and lots of dog owners and dog trainers uh, and dogs, something happened to me at an APDT meeting that caused me, that, that aroused my curiosity. And it was this. There had been an event on stage. I was, I was offering to troubleshoot with the clicker people's problems on stage. What arrogance. You know, they could easily have brought me some problem that would have taken six months to fix. But <laughs> fortunately, the first one that came up was a, a woman with a Labrador that she was training for obedience. And the dog was supposed to pick up a dumbbell and carry it to her and hold it in its jaws. And one of the rules in obedience competition is that the dog can't chew it. Is to hold it still, you know, and not fiddle with it in its mouth. Well, this dog had taken chewing and fiddling with the dumbbell to such a high art that it never held the dumbbell still for a single minute. What had so what had been happening, I think, was that the owner was trying to click it, but she was clicking late. So very often she had actually clicked the dumbbell while the dog while the dumbbell was still moving, and she had, without intending to, shaped all of this. And now she was waiting for the dog to hold it still, and the dog was going on and on. I know she clicks me when I'm moving it, trying harder and harder to move it and trying to make it longer and longer and longer until finally the dog lay down on the stage and threw the dumbbell up in the air on its back, threw the dumbbell up in the air and caught it. And I thought, this dog is really (laughs) trying to earn a click. It just doesn't have a picture, you know? Right, right. We got the wrong picture. So I took the dog myself and and clicked it for just touching the dumbbell and for holding it, and then for holding it for one nanosecond, and then for holding it a little longer. It was really, I had sharper timing, and I could get in there when before it had started all this experimenting. Anyway, we solved the problem. The dog learned, oh, my God, that's all you want? Just hold it? Oh, that's so easy. And now she could click it because it was holding it. So problem solved. Everybody's happy. They go off stage. The next day, We're down in the auditorium somewhere. I'm standing around, and this woman walks over with her dog beside her, and she talked. We talked for a while, and indeed, the problem was fixed, so I was happy. And sometime during that conversation, the dog, without looking at me, without wagging its tail, walks over and licks me on the back of the hand, one firm lick on the hand, and then goes back to its owner. And I thought my immediate sort of guess was it seemed as if the dog was saying, hey, thanks for clearing that up, lady. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) Not, hi, Karen, boy, am I glad to see you. No, it wasn't like that. It was just kind of, you know, (laughs) a little salutation. 
It happened yes, to me. Yes. Yeah, it was a different kind of a thing. So it happened to me again with another dog, and it had in the past happened with a dolphin. So I, I was willing to allow this from a dolphin, you know, but a dog, this seemed a little fancy. The third time it happened with a dog, I was sure. It was, again, the same situation. I solved a problem that the dog was having trouble with, and the dog, in this case, it was a, a Chesapeake Bay Retriever. When it got a chance, a very well-trained obedience dog never does anything uh, out of line. dog stood up on her hind legs and licked me from chin to forehead. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> the owner was so flabbergasted that she couldn't even remember to, uh, you know, correct the dog or anything. She just <gasps> never saw her do anything like that. Well, I had, right. I had I, stopped. I, I, <laughs> so, anyway, I think they I, were saying I, thank you. I do, too. I have seen that maybe in, in dogs that are very aroused. They're barking. Maybe they might be lunging at other dogs. And then we teach them what to do. And it's almost like they turn to you and say, thanks, I needed that. You know, I just, I didn't like the state of mind I was in before. I was very conflicted. I was confused. And now it's black or white. Now now I understand what to do and I can, I can learn. So I I definitely agree with you on that. We only have a few more minutes, but I want to get to one more question for you. There is one more chapter in the book about having conversations with animals and how animals are teaching people. If you can briefly just talk about that, if you don't mind. Well, that's because I like that one too. Oh, sure. I loved it. Too. Didn't you like Josephine, the nasty dolphin? Yes, yes. <laughs> Wicked old lady. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> it is a two-way street, and these the animals get better at it, and as you get more observant, uh, you can find yourself exchanging a lot of information. What's going on over there? Well, I don't know. Well, let's go see. You know, you find yourself really working back and forth in a new kind of way, and the clicker does not need to be part of this. This is the payoff for using the clicker to teach a few behaviors. From then on, you've got an awake learning animal. You yourself have learned to watch and think, what's going on with her? Let's give a little respect here. Let's not just try to stop it. Let's look and see what's going on. Let's be grateful when we see thanks and when we see uh, uh, happiness. You know, let's, let's, you've got something going back and forth. And uh, uh, that really looks to me like a conversation. I, I've reported several of them in the book, one with a cat, I think, one with an elephant, uh, one with a long one with a dolphin, a uh, very sophisticated old dolphin. And, uh, uh, and that's a place that's so nice to be there with your pet, where you understand each other beyond the simple... We, we don't, in, a, in a way, we set our sights too low. You know, we're just happy mm. if it doesn't get in our hair, if it doesn't make trouble, if it's housebroken. But there's so much more we can have in the way of enjoying them and they, us, available to us. You don't have to have the clicker in your pocket. That's just for the beginning stages. But you can change the way you see them, change the way they see you, and it's so rewarding. Oh, what a nice way to end this interview. Lovely, lovely. You can learn more about reaching the animal's mind and clicker training by going to Karen's website, which is clickertraining.com. And can they also uh, purchase your any of your books on that site, Karen? Absolutely. But also the new book, Reaching the Animal Mind, Pia, it has its own website with videos from the stories in the book. Uh, scientific papers you can download to back up the information if you want to dig a little deeper. Uh, photographs of some of the, it, it's got information for each chapter, has its own web page with uh, live video and, and a lot more enriching the book and filling it in. So yeah, that's, what website that website is, that? is reachingtheanimalmind.com. Wonderful, wonderful. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Next week, I think we'll have a little surprise. Maybe we'll do some clicker training in our training session. So I'd like to thank Karen for joining us. I'd also like to give a special thanks to our producers for making the show happen. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the show, please email me at pia at petliferadio.com. So until next time, this is Pia signing off. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for listening to Pet Life Radio. Bye-bye. School's in session on Pet Life Radio with Teacher's Pet. Learn how to communicate with your pet, train your pet, and see the world from your pet's point of view. You may even learn a few tricks yourself. Teacher's Pet, only on PetLifeRadio.com.